Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that in our, our confusion, we recognize the need for your hand in our lives. And when we responded, we were amazed because you gave us something worth living for. Not just in this life, but in the life that you promised. And what you promised, you are faithful. So bless each one, O oh God, as we continue before you in Jesus' name. Amen. But the Seeper is going to come and read this morning's scripture for us. morning church morning. my reading this morning will be from Joshua 2 Rahab right hides the spies and Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies saying go view the land especially Jericho and they went and came into a, into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to, uh, sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out, our, uh, search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came, came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when the, and when the gate was about to be closed at, the, at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she laid in order she laid in order on the on the roof so the men paused after so the men pursued after them on the way to uh, to the jordan as far as the fords and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out before the men before the men lay down she came up to them on the roof and said to the men i know that the lord has given you the land and that the fear of you the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt any away from away before you for when we for we have heard how the lord dried up the water of the red sea before you when you came out of egypt and what you did to the two kings of the amorites who were beyond the jordan to, uh, to uh, Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. As, and as soon as they heard it, our hearts melted, and, they, and there was, a, was, was no spirit left in, in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, Please swear to me by the Lord that as he as I have dealt kindly to you you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save you will save alive my father and my mother my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death and the men said to her our life for yours even to death if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by the rope through the window of the house. Sorry. <laughs> then she let them down by the rope through the window, for her house was built into the city, into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, and the pursuers will uh, go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterwards, 
you may go your way. The men said to her, we will, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made, made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into the house your father and your mother and brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of this house into the street, his blood shall, shall be on his, uh, on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if, but if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, the blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to the oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, <coughs> and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there for three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly, the Lord has given us all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Amen. Thank you. Amen. We're continuing today our story about what faith does and what faith is. We have been looking at the lives of several biblical characters as how they lived by faith. We started off with Father Abraham. We came on down through his sons and grandsons to Jacob and through uh, Joseph and through Moses. and So who do you think should be the next one that was mentioned? Maybe Joshua would have been a man of faith. He's the one who believed God when God said to him, go and walk around the walls of Jericho seven days, once each day for the first six days. And I want you to walk around on the seventh day, seven times, and the walls will fall down. He could have been recommended, but you know that Joshua is not mentioned in the book of Hebrews as one of the stalwarts of faith. You know whose name comes after Moses, the lawgiver, the most powerful man in Israel? Rahab. You ever heard of Rahab? It's a, it's a funny thing about Rahab. Every time you read the name Rahab, she has a title. It's like some of you, you forgive us for something, but you keep on mentioning it every time we turn around. Rahab, the prostitute. Now, all these names mentioned in Hebrews 11, to me, Haber, uh, Rahab is the biggest surprise. Verse 31 says, by faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 says, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient, or those who did not believe, after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Now, if you remember, God had given his promise to Abraham and, and his descendants, Rahab is not a descendant of Abraham. So how did she get in on the app? She was not one of God's people. She was not a person who had lived a perfect, beautiful life. I guess you could call her in a modern parlance. She was a call girl. 
He was a prostitute. But the writer of Hebrews says she was a model of faith. Think about that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has something special to teach you and I today when it comes to Rahab's story. And the story is told in the passage Brother Sipo has just read to you in Joshua chapter 2. When the Israelites were on the verge of entering the promised land, Joshua sent out two spies. Joshua is also very wise. You remember when Moses got there? How many spies did he send out? Twelve. Joshua learned. You can't trust too many people with the secret. So he sent out two. At least the vote he was going to get at least was 50-50. Not what poor Moses got. The spies went into Jericho and stayed at Rahab's place. <laughs> Which begs forth the question. How did they get to Rahab's house? Of all the people in Jericho, what were they doing in Rahab's the harlot's house? Well, you know how it works. You've seen them on the street. I have a feeling they were propositioned by Rahab. Hey, you f young fellas. What's up? Come on over. And they said, we know what you got to offer us, but we got a bigger offer. We come to tell you a story. You can imagine. He said, you proposition us, we're going to proposition you. And she told, they told her the story. Apparently the spies did not do a very good job of concealing their identity. Because pretty soon, the king of Jericho got word that the spies were here. Not even just the spy, but the Israelite spies. And seeing that the Israelites were encamped just across the river from them, the king put two and two together. And he realized the purpose of their visit. So the king sent a delegation to Rahab's house and ordering her to hand over the men. But for some reason, Rahab figured out that that was going to happen. So she took the men up on top of the roof, and she hid them, covering them with flax. If you all know that flax was something you used to, to knit. And so somebody said that she was planning to change her profession. Got all these flax up on top of the roof, you know. And she hid them with it. Came in very handy. She piled a bunch of flax over them, and... So when the delegates came to Rahab, she admitted, yes, they came. They were here. Verse 5 says, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they are from. You're lying, Rahab. They told you. And it came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out, and I don't know where they've gone. But I think she, the, the last part she emphasized. He said, go after them now. Pursue them quickly. Because you'll overtake them. Of course, the, the men they sent, the king sent, wasn't thinking men, right? So off they went. The king's delegation went off to search for the spies uh, while they were safely hidden on top of Rahab's house. That's the last place they thought to search. And you must realize that Rahab did this at great risk to her own life. If she was found out that she had told a lie, she would have been dead. Right? Because this would have been going against the welfare of your people. It was denial. Verse 7, Joshua chapter 2, tells us that after the king's men left the city, went on the lockdown. No one could enter, no one could leave. But the spies were trapped. They were on top of Rahab's house. How are they going to get out? 
Rahab had a plan. You see, Rahab's house was built in the city wall. Verse 15 tells us. So the front of her house was on the city streets, and the back of her house was where? Out in Never Never Land. Open country. So when it got really dark, Rahab got a rope. The Bible said it's a scarlet rope. It's interesting to notice that it was a scarlet rope. Don't forget that. The scarlet thread runs all through the Bible. It was telling them there's a hope coming. The perfect man was going to come to shed his blood for you and I. The scarlet thread runs all the way through God's plan for mankind. So when it was real dark, we have got a rope, let them down on the outside of the wall and tell them, head for high country. And hide out. And she even, even told them, hide out for three days. Interesting, she said, three days. And after that, when the pursuer got fed up and tired, they'll come home and you go back safely. Why did she hide the men? Why did she hide them? She didn't know them. They were strangers. Why did she hide them? And why did she disobey the king and protect them? I'll tell you why. Rahab was not stupid. She was aware of what was happening around her. She had heard stories. And she made her choice on what she had heard. Hebrews chapter 11, 31 says she did it by faith. Interestingly, the last person who you'd have thought would have had faith was a prostitute. But the Bible said the reason why she did it was by faith. And you remember what we said, faith is the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of things hoped for. She wanted a better life. And she knew she wasn't going to get it in Jericho. Notice how simple Rahab's faith was. Verse 31 says, by faith, Rahab did not perish, along with those who did not believe. Very simple. So first we learn from Rahab's faith that you don't have to have a lot of knowledge to believe. You don't have to have a lot of knowledge to believe God. You don't need to have all your questions answered so that you can trust God. Rahab was very limited in what she knew about the, the God of Israel. All she heard was stories. No prophet spoke to her. No one who would have been godly would have gone and tell her the word. She was a write-off. No one explained God's word to her. She knew nothing about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But she knew a little about the workings of the Lord. Listen to her in Joshua 2, verse 9. I know that the Lord has given you the land. Rahab comes from a city of idol worshippers. What she know about the Lord? But I want you to notice something in your Bibles. Verse 9. Did you notice that the word Lord is capital? Capital A, L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Do you know which name is that? That is Yahweh. That's Yahweh. God had said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, I am who I am. That's the word Rahab used. The Lord, the real God. And she mentioned it four times. Verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12. How did she know about God? She heard what he did. And she looked at the gods they worship in Jericho and she said, none of our God has ever done anything for us. This has got to be the real God. So she knew who God is. 
And by the way, you notice I said God is. Because God is never was. God is. So she said in verse 11, The Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and earth beneath. This is the testimony of a prostitute, people. In other words, your God is real. He reigns in heaven and in earth. Our God is false. All of them are false. We've never heard of our God opening anything for anybody. We spend our lives bringing gifts and offerings and we can never satisfy these, these so-called gods. But this God opened up the sea so that his people could walk across. So she knew who a God is. Then she knew the power of God, verse 10. She says in verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord, capital Lord, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. Can you imagine that? Perhaps that I knew about you walking through the middle of the water, water pile on the right and water pile on the left, and you walk in the middle on dry ground. As, you say, as if it has never seen water in his life. What kind of God is that? That's the God I want to be a part of. In other words, your God is real. He reigns in heaven and earth. Our God's in Egypt are phonies. Your God is a great I am. She knew who God is and what God had done. And thirdly, she knew the power of God. He said, she said, for we have heard, we have heard of the power of your God. They all had heard, but all Jericho must have heard. But there's one person who says, I've heard. I don't need no more evidence. All I know, this is the God I want to serve. And she kept it in her heart, and she knew nothing could stop this nation, and nothing could stop the God of this nation. If he can open up the Red Sea, if he can come over there and give them power to, to beat up on Sion and Og, that's the God, because these are powerful men. Thirdly, she also knew that God was what God was about to do. The spies told her. God is about to give us the land. She said, I know it. I can feel it in my bones. And you remember she had said in verse 9, I know that the Lord has given you the land. She said, I know that. I know that. She, because she, see, she knew the long history of our people, that our people was wicked and they were cruel. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, God had said to, to uh, Abraham, in the fourth generation, they shall return to this land that I promised to give to your, your, your descendants. Because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. You know, a lot of people wonder, how oh, could God send these folks into this nation to go and kill off all these people? Why would God do that? It seems to me that they're more, they're more worried about what the wicked nations can do rather than the righteousness of God. You see, God has sent the Israelite in to be the one who punished them for their sins. And by the way, you remember God told Abraham way before uh, Abraham even had children, never mind. It was for God gave them 400 years to repent and they did not repent. 400 years from the promise in, in, in Genesis to this day when Joshua comes into the land. 400 years to repent. And we know that if we don't repent, judgment is coming. Because it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Every human being will have to come before Almighty God on a judgment day. To give an account of what you've done in this life. And did you receive the salvation he sent you through Christ? Every one of us, you could be big as you think you are. One of these days, you will bow your knees before God Almighty to give an account. Rahab recognized that. 
And she recognized that judgment was coming because God has given them an opportunity to turn around and they wouldn't. And so she said, I know that the Lord has given you the land. I know that. So we learn from Rahab's faith that faith rests on who God is. What he has done and what he will do. So who is God? Here's a pagan prostitute telling us who God is. In spite of all the information we got. She says he is the ruler of heaven and earth. And that was enough for her. If he rules heaven and earth, what other God do I need? So she knew what, who he is. She knew what he had done. You know what he's done for us? He sent his only begotten son to be a living sacrifice for you and me. He died for our sins. And he raised them from the dead so that we have hope. So we who believe in Christ will live again, even though we die. And thirdly, what will God do? You've got to answer that question. What will God do? God will bring justice and God will destroy evil. Because the place he's preparing for you and I, there's not going to be any evil entering there. Because you know even the old heaven has to pass away. Because remember, the devil touched heaven with sin. So God said, I'm going to make all things new. So that we have a brand new start. And then God will bring his people into all that he has promised. What has God promised? To his people who believe today in Jesus Christ. A new heaven and a new earth. Where righteousness shall reign forever and ever. And when you get to the end of forever, you start all over again. Now, Rahab didn't have a Bible. Rahab didn't have a pastor or Christian friends. But she knew that this great God in is in heaven. And he's coming again to judge the world. And she knew that because God is righteous, he has to bring judgment on a sinful people. But he would reward, and he will reward, the faithful ones. So you don't have to know everything about the Bible before you can believe. You don't have to have all the questions that you are asking and sometimes, some of you are asking too many questions anyway. And the question you're asking, you're just trying to defer. You're just trying to not to be confronted with the fact that you're a sinner who needs a God Savior. So God reigns in heaven and he rules over all the earth. And he is who he said he is, not who you think he is. A lot of people have all kinds of opinion as to who God is. I don't care what your opinion is. It don't count. God is God. And there's none like him. And here's another thing that we need to keep in mind. If you're hedging your bets and thinking that you have tomorrow to change, God will judge sin. And God will destroy evil. If you don't meet him as Lord today, you're going to meet him as judge when you die. And if you meet him as judge when you die, you're going to be in serious trouble. Because there's no turning after that. But he's also a good God, isn't he? He sent his only begotten son to save us. Us who believe so that we may not die and be separated from God for eternity. And realistically, when you think about it, he died in your place. He died in my place. You realize that? He substituted. You should have hung on the cross. I should have hung on the cross, but it would not mean anything. Because we are unrighteous. The unrighteous can't die for the unrighteous. He had to be the righteous son of God. He was my substitute. 
I should have died. And if I had died, I would have been lost forever. But he took my place. He took your place. Glory to God. And you need to honor him by saying, thank you, Lord. I'm ready to switch allegiance because you died for me. Now, what was the proof of Rahab's commitment? The proof of Rahab's commitment shows up in what she did. She hid two of God's people. So we understand that faith shows commitment by what it does. And this is seen all through Hebrews chapter 11. Because they believed, they went out and did amazing things. Because faith doesn't stand still. James talked about that in James when he said, show me your faith, I'll show you my works. But you can't have works without your faith. They go hand in hand. You believe in Christ, you'll go and you'll do good stuff. The stuff that you're doing without Christ is just, you're just doing it to feel good and to let people pat you on the back. But it's harder when you can love those, the unlovely, and forgive those who have sinned against you and do good to them who despitefully use you. That's grace. That's salvation. Faith shows itself up by what it does. So Rahab did not perish. Why? Because she believed God. And she knew that God was the God of justice. And she knew that judgment was coming. And she knew she didn't want to be there to be judged when it come because she knew it would have been total annihilation. Besides, she literally gambled her life, didn't she? To, say, to, 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 to hide these spies. If they had been found in her house, they would have, they, they, they would have demolished her house and killed everybody that was in her house. But she believed God, see? She knew that God would protect her. And now, because of the time in which we live, people tend to think that faith is a private matter. It's between me and God. Have you heard people say that? It's between me and God. As if you really count. But here in Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that faith shows itself in the commitment we make to God's people. And who is God's people these days? The church. You've got to be committed to your church. You know, they have all kinds of things to say about the church. You ever heard that? Even Christians now are bad mouth in the church. When you do that, maybe in my opinion, you're not Christian. This is the church that Jesus Christ died for, that God loves. This is God's people. Be careful what you say about God's people. You think there were not bad people in Israel? You know how many of them died in the wilderness? But God loved them. It's his people. And you can't mess with God's people. May, Rahab made a lifelong commitment to God's people. And after the destruction of Jericho, she was the only survivor. She and her family. We read in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 25, I think, that Rahab and her family were saved when Israel came. So she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. The latter part of verse 25 of Joshua chapter 6 says, Rahab has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. That's the day when this was written. For she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. The spies honored their word to her when she let them promise to save her and her father's household. Notice in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 12 what she says. She want them to swear. So she said, now therefore, please, swear to me 
by Yahweh. I don't want to hear you go, um, uh, um, uh, 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 give me a sign. I, I, I swear, I swear by my heart. No, no. She said, I don't want to. I want you to swear by Yahweh. Because I know when you swear by Yahweh, it shall be done. And you can't back out to swear to me by Yahweh, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with me and my father's household. And they said, yes, our God is Lord. She made them promise in the name of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. She knew that if they promised in the name of the Lord, they would never break their promise. So she made a pact. Verse 18 says, When we come into the land, tie this cord of scarlet in the window through which you let us down and gather to yourself into the house your father and your mother and your brothers and your sisters. Make sure they're in the house. She gathered all her family into her house and she tied the, the red scarlet in the window. She had let them down out in the backyard there and but I wonder something. I wonder how her family felt when Reb showed at their door and tell her, you better come to my house. Come, you better come to my house, you know, and things are happening. Just trust me. I'm sure they didn't like what she was doing. How would you feel if Rahab was your daughter? And come to your house telling you about Jesus. Huh? Farmer, <laughs> you, you said, huh? She's after something. She's after something. She wants us to come over to her house? Hmm. That girl? But they believe, see. They trusted her for some reason. And I think the reason why they trusted her is because she told them about this God that she has discovered. She was a witness. She told them about how God is going to judge sin. They knew the city of Jericho, what it was like. They had heard about what God had done as well. She said, do you remember how we heard about this God who opened this river? Yeah. Remember how he captured Sion and Hog over there? Yeah, we heard all about that. Well, guess what? Those same people is across the river. If you go on the house up and take a good peek over River Jordan, you'll see their tents. They're coming. So you better come to my house if you want to live. Reb lived a deeply immoral life. She did, she did many bad things. She was one of the original bad girls. Apart from being a prostitute, we know that she lied a little bit too. Well, that shouldn't surprise you. She lied when the king sent to demand those men. Who knows what else she did, but you know what? She had belief in her heart. The spark of the, of the wisdom of God energized her, and she began to think. And we know that the Bible didn't encourage lying. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us to speak truth but she was a beginner but the Bible looked past her sins and saw her faith isn't it interesting that beloved is the grace of God some of us were there we said oh we couldn't have been bad like Rahab that's okay you can say whatever you want you are a sinner, just like she was. It's just that she's sinning in a different category. But she heard and she believed. So what can I say to you this morning? Draw near to God in faith and repentance. And by the way, I know some of you think that you're holy. And you know, um, it's almost like I never sinned. My little sin is very little. Well, it's spelled the same way. So whether it's little, minuscule, or massive, 
You're a sinner. You need to be saved. You need to commit yourself to the Lord. You need to commit yourselves. Your past, your present, and your future. And you need to know this. When you've committed your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be forgiven. You will be accepted. You will be adopted into God's family. And you will be loved. And you will be saved. When judgment comes, you don't have to worry. God has promised. Jehovah, Yahweh has promised. When you believe, he's given you salvation. And that salvation in Christ, never to be taken away from you. No matter how awful your sin may be, it cannot stop you from receiving God's mercy. I have a feeling that the worse you are, the better it is too. That doesn't mean you go out and do it, by the way. And if you believe that, that God will be merciful to you, just like he was merciful to Rahab, the Bible says, by faith, Rahab did not perish along with those who were disobedient. And not only did not, she did not perish physically, but she did not perish spiritually. You know how I know? God's grace offers real hope to everyone, even to someone like Rahab, someone like me, and someone like you, who might Rehab might have thought, me, I have no hope. Look at me. I run a body house. Everybody despised me apart from my clients. You know, the priest saw me spit on me. But God welcomed her. But she believed God. And God showed a way to demonstrate her faith. Give, give a way to demonstrate her faith because she had become one of God's people. But you know what the best part is about Rahab? Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Rahab's name pop up again. And we read that Rahab married a man named Salmon. And Rahab had a son named Boaz. Enough said. The kinsman redeemer. Who became the father of Obed. Obed became the father of Jesse. Jesse became the father of David. And David's son, Jesus Christ. See the line through which the Messiah came? Can you imagine Rahab being the great, 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 great grandmother of none other than our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't God amazing? Isn't God amazing? If we had written that story, we would not have put the part, we would have said, Rahab, the lady who lived on the wall. God said, no, no. Rahab was a harlot. What is he saying? For some of us who think we're nothing and who are the least of the brothers and the sisters, God says, I love you. Come unto me. All you who have labored and think you're nothing, and I will make you someone. And not only that, I have a robe for you. One of these days I'm going to clothe you in the righteousness of Christ. Because God says to you, you know right now, when I look at you, you know who I see? I see my son in you. I see you clothed in his righteousness. And we will say, Lord, we don't deserve it. He said, let me be the one who make that decision. I'm the one who saw you and sent my holy and righteous son from glory who came and died for you. Don't you ever tell me you are nothing. 
Don't you ever tell me that I'm unworthy. Christ didn't die for unworthy people. He died to make you worthy. Yes, we were aliens, separated from God, doing our own thing, but we were lost when Christ came. So Rhea became the great grandmother again of King David, from whose line came the Lion of Judah, Jesus the Christ. Isn't God good? That's what God's grace did for Rahab. And that is what God's grace will do for you. Because he done it for me. And if he could do it for me, he'll do it for anybody. Think of what God's grace can do for you, my beloved. Yeah, you. Think of what it can do for you. And trust him. Trust him. Glory to God. What an amazing God he is. May God wake you up this morning and show you how precious you are to him so that you may, from wherever you are, if Rhea could make it, so can you. But you've got to believe and you've got to put your trust in Jesus Christ because he says, no one come to the Father but through me. This is your opportunity. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way you love. No one can love like you. But Father, give us the ability to try and love our neighbors, love the forsaken, love sinners, so that we can be concerned and we can show the light in their darkened lives. We thank you that you did it for us who have believed. And we know you will continue to do it for anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we honor you today, Lord, by saying thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for making me whole. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As you can see, we're set up for a communion this morning, and we want to we're going to be singing 590. He touched me, just like how he touched that poor lady who thought she was. out of sorts with the world, but God remembered her, 590. Some of us have allowed the world to shackle us in their pursuits, and we don't want to give it up. But if that's what we live for, we're in trouble, because this world is passing by. And we need to know that heaven is on its shore coming. So let's stand and sing as we prepare our hearts and mind for the table of the Lord. <clears throat> Shackled by a heavy burden Need the Lord of guilt and shame
once I met this blessed Savior. Since He cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while it turns. me and all oh, the joy that fed my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made touched me. Thank you, Lord God. We're gathered today around the communion table. We call it the table of the Lord. And we have specific directions as when we come around the Lord. What it means and what it ought to mean to us. And we, there's come also a warning as we gather around the communion table. The Apostle Paul said, I have received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed, and when he, had, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he says, I quote, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we are the guests this morning at the Lord's table. He's with us. And so as the ushers come forward to... Uh, bring the emblems to you. Paul said we need to take a little time to think on these things. To examine ourselves. Not to find out if we're worthy because none of us are. We're sinners saved by the grace of God. And, but he wants you to remember what God has done for you. How he did. When he did. When he touched you and made you whole. So let's just take a moment in time to do that. We're going to ask Brother Israel to return thanks for the bread that represent the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we examined ourselves, O oh God, we realize how oh, unworthy we are. But because of your grace, your love, you sent your Son, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to be the ultimate price for my sin. We thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you for loving me so much. 
The Bible said after they had broken the bread and he had prayed, he said, take it, this is my body which is broken to it for you. Let us do so in unity. Okay, we're going to ask Brother Seaford to give thanks for the cup that represents the blood of Christ.
heaven, joy of heaven, the precious name. Oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven. The Bible said after he had taken the cup, he said, this, is, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is the covenant that supersedes the former covenant. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to be singing 128 in our hymnals. As we have been refreshed and energized by his word and his spirit, we want to sing triumphantly like they did that night in the upper room. Marvelous grace of our loving ones. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> Great. 
grace, marvelous grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. And we believe that, Lord. For those who believe today, may the Spirit of God bring forth a refreshing and a restoration and a cleansing and an empowering to live the life that would please our God. The Bible said after they had sung a hymn, they went out. And we're going to go out to face our Gethsemane, our struggles, our failures, etc. It's waiting, but go with God. He's with you, He's for you, and He will fight on your behalf because you're his people of his pasture and he's our good shepherd so may God the father keep smiling on you may God the son keep on interceding for you and may the God the Holy Spirit continue to abide in you through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen God bless you